Ford's second generation S-Max remains a large seven-seater MPV for people who, well, don't like MPVs. Ford calls this a sports activity vehicle that people carry a certainly, but one that's more involving to drive and nicer to look at. This sharper looking Mark II model reinterprets this apparently contradictory concept with greater efficiency and technology, remaining a breath of fresh air in what can otherwise be a pretty dull sector of the market. Owning an MPV, particularly a large one, isn't supposed to be one of life's memorable experiences. A people carrier is normally a grudge purchase, a vehicle you need rather than one you might want. Or at least it usually is. Ford thinks differently. That's why they brought us the S-Max, here rejuvenated in second generation guys. In a market where most brands don't even bother to offer one large MPV people carrying model, you might wonder why the blue oval maker feels the need to bring us two. The company's now also redesigned Galaxy 7-seater does, after all, share showroom space with this S-Max. Ford, though, sees the pair as appealing to very different kinds of family buyers and slots the two models into two slightly different MPV market segments. The more practical Galaxy targets traditional large people carriers like Volkswagen's Charan and say it's Alhambra. This more dynamic S-Max model, in contrast, is described by the brand's marketeers as a sports activity vehicle and its slightly lower price and slightly smaller interior position it closer to seven seat MPVs derived from more compact designs. Cars like Renault's Grand Scenic, Citroën's Grand C4 Picasso and Vauxhall's Zafira Tura. You could argue with some justification, as Ford does, that none of the cars I've just mentioned are really quite the same as this one. And it's likely that many of the 400,000 families who bought the original first generation version of this model would agree with you. Right from its initial launch back in 2006, the S-Max has, after all, always set out to offer something different, more interesting, more involving and more stylish than conventional MPVs of whatever size. Here is a car you could genuinely look forward to driving. A car as happy on the return from the school run as it was fully laden with seven passengers on the way there. You got the best of both worlds then, in a Ford that was nicely built and slick to look at. In short, there wasn't much wrong with it. Well, all right, there were a few things, and nearly all of them resided under the bonnet. By the end of the Mark I model's production run, other rivals had powered ahead in terms of efficiency, while also offering smarter cabins and extra technology. Worse still for Ford, by now, plush people carriers weren't alone in targeting potential S-Max customers. Affordable seven-seat SUVs like Kia Sorento, Hyundai Santa Fe and Land Rover's Discovery Sport now also offered tempting alternatives for lifestyle orientated buyers. It all hastened the need for this smarter, more frugal, higher quality second generation S-Max model, launched here in the summer of 2015. It's stuffed with segment leading technology and also includes an all wheel drive option to keep those SUVs in their place. Plus, it claims to be just as stylish and rewarding as its revolutionary predecessor. Can it continue to offer an appealing option if you need a large MPV but just don't want one? Let's find out. The fact that Ford has its marginally more sensible Galaxy model for those only concerned with practical seven-seat A to B family transport leaves this S-Max free to provide something pretty unique in this segment for bigger MPVs. Namely, a good-looking car dynamically capable enough to reward the enthusiastic driver. Other big seven-seaters feel vaguely pointless if you're alone in them on the move. This one shrinks around you and encourages you to take the back road home. You sit slightly lower than you would in a more conventional people carrier, but that's not much in it really, and the driving position is still properly commanding. Nor do you have to drive very far to begin to appreciate this Ford's various dynamic attributes. True, the electric power steering introduced into this second generation model isn't quite as 
responsive as the original version's old hydraulic setup, but it still gives you more of a feel for what's happening under the wheels than you would expect a large people carrier to offer, optionally aided by a freshly developed active front steering feature that adjusts the steering ratio to match your speed. It's all uh, confidence inspiring in a way you'll appreciate even if you aren't one of those people who likes to press on a bit. Come to this S Max after a drive in another seven seat people carrier, and we'd suggest that you prove the point by asking the salesperson to let you include a twisting country road on your test route. Let's assume you've done that. Well, you should then notice an improvement in two main areas. First, the more supple ride. Second, the reduction in body roll. Both are heavily influenced by this second generation model's clever integral link rear suspension, a setup that Ford also uses on its Mustang sports car. In a market where so many MPVs drive like uh, vans with windows, it's a package that delivers a kind of accomplished ride and handling compromise you'd usually only get from a really well-sorted family five-door. The result is a beautiful balance and flow that works not only on minor routes, but also feels really composed over the long wave undulations served up by most faster A roads. All of which probably isn't surprising, given that the engines and virtually all the underpinnings of this car are indeed borrowed from a really well-sorted family five-door, Ford's fourth-generation Mondeo. Don't get me wrong here, this remains a tall and heavy car that's over 1.7 tonnes in weight, so don't expect to be able to throw it about like a hot hatch, because of course you can't. But if we're judging by the very modest standards of the people carrying class, then you'd have to say that the S Max remains a dynamic revelation. Stick it into a corner and it clings on with light-footed precision, aided by a clever torque vectoring system that lightly breaks the inside front wheels through the tight bends, sharpening turn-in and ensuring that all the power gets onto the tarmac. In other markets, Ford offers this car with an adaptive damping system that allows you to sharpen things up still further, something that you can't have here and for the reasons I gave earlier, you probably don't really need. Anyway, there's plenty of other optional technology to spend your money on. I've already talked about the active steering system and that's just the start. Here we've been trying the adaptive LED headlights that turn with the bends and which feature a glare-free high beam system that can keep them constantly on maximum brightness in a way that doesn't dazzle other road users. Then there is the active speed limiter feature that automatically adapts your speed to the prevailing limit, theoretically making the possibility of getting zapped by a camera or a radar gun a thing of the past. And an adaptive cruise control system for highway travel that uses a radar to automatically keep you a safe distance behind the vehicle ahead. On top of that, you can also specify the usual optional systems that allow the car to automatically park itself and autonomously stop itself if a forward-facing camera detects a hazard ahead. Our favourite high-tech feature, though, is standard fit on all S-Max models, the Ford MyKey system. This enables you to program a separate key for your car that will control the vehicle's use if you lend it out, say, to your son or daughter. This can allow you to restrict your S-Max's top speed, prevent deactivation of the driver assistance and the safety features, inhibit incoming phone calls, reduce the audio system's volume, and even disable the stereo completely if the seat belts aren't being used. As you'd expect, there's just as much technology on offer under the bonnet, as was necessary if this car was going to keep pace with its rivals. At the bottom of the range, Ford is offering a 1.5-litre EcoBoost SCTi petrol option, but this is a power plant that really better suits the brand's smaller C-Max model. True, this unit's 160 PS output is willing enough, and the performance figures, rest to 62 miles an hour in 9.9 .9 seconds en route to 124 miles an hour, don't sound too bad. The problem, though, comes with a lack of pulling power that you'll really notice when your S-Max is fully laden. There's around 30% less torque on offer here than even the feeblest of the diesel variants can muster. So, it's a diesel that you'll probably want. The various TDCI variants remain all of two litres in size, but are, Ford assures us, quite different than those on offer before. 
They certainly contribute to quieter progress. The engineers claiming an improvement in refinement of up to three decibels in comparison to the original version of this car. More importantly, these Euro 6 power plants are more efficient and powerful than their predecessors. The mainstream choice being between 120 PS, 150 PS and 180 PS versions. We try and avoid the feeblest one. It takes 13.4 seconds to get to 62 miles an hour en route to 114 miles an hour. Better is the 150 PS variant which, courtesy of 350 newton meters of torque, improves those figures to 10.8 seconds and 123 miles an hour. Here though I'm sampling the 180 PS derivative where the figures are 9.7 seconds and 131 miles an hour. With the 150 PS and 180 PS variants you get the chance to pay extra for Ford's smooth dual clutch six speed power shift automatic gearbox. I'm trying it here. With these two engines there's also the extra cost option of turning this front wheel drive model into one that can send power to all four of its wheels courtesy of Ford's intelligent all wheel drive system. This setup, which is a freshly introduced feature of this second generation model, aims to tempt towers and buyers who might otherwise be looking at a seven seat family SUV. There's no ride height change, so if you've got an S Max fitted with this setup, there's no point in trying to stick it down a deeply rutted forest track. It will, however, be ideal for slippery, sloping tarmac driveways, icy mornings and muddy car parks. With the lower powered engine, the system comes mated to the usual six speed manual transmission, while the 180 PS power plant has to have this intelligent all wheel drive setup with a power shift auto box. That only leaves the two performance orientated S Max models, both likely to remain vanishingly rare in our market and both available only with two wheel drive and the power shift auto transmission. Diesel drivers seeking sensationally rapid progress get the option of a 2 litre bi turbo engine with 210 PS and a potent 450 newton metres of torque. It manages 62 miles an hour in 8.8 .8 seconds and 135 miles an hour, and you'd love it if you regularly engage in transcontinental towing. The petrol range, meanwhile, is topped off by the 2 litre EcoBoost turbo engine Ford uses in its Focus ST hot hatch. This unit here putting out 240 PS and capable of 62 miles an hour in 8.4 seconds en route to 140 miles an hour. No one's precisely copied the style that made the first generation version of this S Max so successful. Perhaps though that's because improving on the look of the original version was always going to be difficult. There's only so much you can do after all to make a seven seater people carrier seem sporty if you still want the car in question to be in any way practical. Maybe a slight slope to the rear roof line, perhaps a power vent in the front wing. Both these things define the original S Max design and do so once again here in a look that remains very different to that of the car's more sensibly orientated Galaxy Stablemate. Here you've got the same width as you'll find in that car but packaged into a shape that's 92mm lower and 52mm shorter. Photos of this second generation S Max suggest styling only lightly evolved from that of the Mark 1 model, but in the metal, that lower roof line, the slimline lights and the muscular rear haunches ensure that this improved version appears sharper and more distinctive than before. Helping in this is the way that the front A pillars have been moved further back to create a longer, more sculpted bonnet that flows into the raised, chromed, trapezoidal Ford front grille that's now familiar from other cars in the company's range. It's flanked here by intricately crafted headlamps that incorporate daytime running lights made up of three LED strips that also function as indicators flashing sequentially towards the direction of the turn. There's more of this kind of technology if you opt for the headlamps in the clever adaptive LED guys where they move with the bends and feature a glare free high beam for perfect full illumination that doesn't also dazzle oncoming traffic. Technology led design then as the S Max has always had. The original version was one of the first Fords to feature the kinetic brand styling philosophy that has defined the look of blue oval brand models over the past decade. And you'll find further evidence of its influence in a profile that's been finished with a touch more maturity this time around. 
The old car's big wheel arch blisters have been replaced by more subtle flared arches. And at the front, these are set off by this smaller, simpler side power vent. From here, a distinctive swage line flows back through the door handles to a rear section characterised by a second, shorter, higher crease that gives the silhouette a bit more purpose. At the same time that this third, low-set styling line gives the flanks a bit more shape. It's at the rear, though, where we think this design update has been most successful. A hot hatch-style rear diffuser on an MPV. It's provided here as part of a sharper, smarter, more gym-toned look that's a world away from the bluff, boxy shape you'd expect to characterise the back of a large people carrier. Particularly nice are these slimmer, more stylish LED tail lights that add visual width and are connected by this satin chromed strip. As usual, though, more important is the stuff you can't see. As you'd expect, the underpinnings are shared with that Galaxy MPV model, but were originally developed for the brand's sophisticated fourth-generation Mondeo, hence the adoption of that car's aluminium-crafted integral link rear suspension. Time to take a seat behind the wheel. As before, the vast glass area and the slim windscreen pillars mean that all-round visibility is excellent. Plus, it's easy to find the ideal driving position thanks to the considerable amount of seat and wheel adjustment provided and the way the headrests go forward and back as well as up and down. You can even drop the seat very low if you've bought into the dynamic drive marketing speak and you want more of a hot hatch style feel. The other aspect of the way that this car is being sold relates to the appeal that Ford hopes it will have beyond the MPV market amongst buyers who might be considering prestigiously badged SUVs or executive estates. Hence the wide range of optional luxury embellishments on offer, electric steering column adjustment and multi-contour cooled heated massaging seats for example, here finished in lovely stitched leather. The higher quality of fit and finish the Spanish Valencia factory has produced around the cabin should also help in interesting these kinds of people. Chrome accents frame the air vents and smarten up the lower part of the centre console and the passenger side of the fascia, while soft touch materials and accent stitching are used throughout. Inevitably, given the underpinnings I previously mentioned, there's a lot that's shared here with Ford's Mondeo, but that's no issue given the quality built into that car in its current guise. Ahead of you, through the leather-trimmed three-spoke multifunction steering wheel, there is a clear, classy instrument cluster that in mid- and upper-range models gives you this sophisticated 10.2-inch TFT setup made up of various instant multifunction displays. The two outer ones are framed by conventional speedometer and rev counter gauges with trip computer information on the left and safety functionality depicted on the right. In the middle, you get to entertainment, navigation and phone options. Anything that this setup can't tell you will probably be covered by the feature that on all models dominates the centre of the dash, the 8-inch SYNC 2 colour touchscreen, there to play its part in reducing button clutter and giving the cabin a cleaner, smarter feel. This setup's divided into four colour-coded sectors that allows you to control audio, phone, climate control and, where fitted, sat-nav functions via touchscreen buttons. Heating and ventilation is also covered off by switchgear below the screen, which is just as well since the display buttons can be a little slow and fiddly to use. Instead of stabbing away at these, it's better to try and master the system's impressive voice-activated functionality that allows you to issue simple one-shot commands like play song to play a track from a CD, where am I to find out where you are, or even I'm hungry to bring up a list of local restaurants from the system's built-in Michelin guide. Directions can then be activated from the split-screen navigation display. Practical touches include overhead space for your sunglasses and a compartment that opens to reveal one of those useful little extra mirrors that allows you to keep an eye on what the kids are doing in the back. It's just one of a whole range of storage compartments dotted around the cabin into which all those stickle bricks and felt pens and minion suites can be crammed. 
Um, all are useful in terms of size and shape and include a fascia top storage box this time around, as well as a neat pull-out cubby down to the right of the steering wheel and also a lidded box at the bottom of the centre console that's for the storage of your phone or iPod as it incorporates aux in, USB and SD card points, as well as a 12-volt socket. Look behind this area and there's a further open storage space. Plus, this middle armrest opens to reveal a tray and coin holder area beneath which is a deep recess. Two large cup holders sit behind the gear stick, making use of a space freed up by the switch from a conventional handbrake to one of those awkward buttons that car makers now seem to like so much. Plus, there's a reasonably sized glove box and decently sized door pockets. We like the little design touches you can't see too. For example, the way the seating trim has been designed not to snag on zips and clothing studs. To prevent this, a metal ball with needle-sharp spikes called a mace, just like the medieval weapon, is used to brush the fabric over 600 times through the production process. Equally practical is the humidity sensor that stops the windows fogging up and delivers best-in-class cooling in hot weather. Then there's the high-tech air filter, eight years in development, which is 50% more effective than its predecessor in blocking ultrafine particles, dealing with 99% of pollen to help the quarter of Europeans who apparently suffer from hay fever. Time to start thinking about the 32 different seating and load space combinations that this car can offer. And we'll start by checking out this middle row. Here you'll find that the three individual seats provided do most of what MPV buyers would expect them to do, sliding back and forth and reclining for greater comfort on longer journeys. What's missing are the few of the features that you'll find in some of Ford's other seven-seat MPVs. Take their van-based Grand Tourneo Connect model, where you can fully remove the seats from the car and use a useful recessed underfloor storage bin. The one in the S-Max is taken up with a toolkit. Then there's the Blue Oval brand's smaller Grand C-Max model's neat seat-eating seat mechanism, designed for those times when you've only to carry a couple of people in the middle row, and also offered in this segment, incidentally, on Vauxhall's rival Zafira Tura. That setup enables three chairs to morph into a couple of larger, more comfortable ones, while freeing up a walkway rearwards. Enough, though, on what we don't have here. Having spent some time with this S-Max, we think that what it does provide for middle row folk will be quite satisfactory for most potential buyers. We like Ford's preference for stadium-style seat positioning that enables you to better see forward through to the front, although this approach could compromise ultimate headroom a little for really tall people, especially in a car fitted with this huge optional glass panorama roof. The payoff, though, is the commanding airy feel that this particular model provides, with everyday practicality aided in this case by the fitment of the extra-cost family pack that most bars will want. This includes side window blinds, seat back tables and a 230 volt power outlet. Oh, time to check out the third row, now a little more easily accessible thanks to this easy entry one touch mechanism that flings the seat forward, up and out of your way. Now, it's at this point that you realise what this car actually is. If you read all the usual ill-informed reviews, they'll tell you how MPVs like Renault's Grand Scenic and Citroën's Grand C4 Picasso will save you some money over an S-Max, but then you'd expect cars like that to be cheaper. They're based on the stretched floor plans of focus-sized family hatchbacks. Or, to put it another way, they really compete against Ford's smaller Grand C-Max model. And S-Max, in contrast, is, as I've been saying, based on the floor plan of the Blue Oval brand's Mondeo, a bigger class of car. And the difference that makes is best experienced here. Whereas in a Grand Scenic or a Grand C4 Picasso, the third row chairs are really only for children. In an S-Max, you can use them for adults too, provided the journey isn't going to be excessively long. To be specific, you get 70 millimetres more headroom back here than you would do in a Grand C4 Picasso. And that's the difference, summed up in one stat. 
It is a bit annoying that neither of these rearmost pews get Isofix child seat fastenings. These are only fitted to the chairs in the middle row. Still, both third row passengers do get their own cup holders and the person on the right side gets a lidded storage box too. On to boot space, which, if you pay the extra, can be accessed by one of those powered rear tailgates you can activate by waving your foot beneath the bumper, should you find yourself approaching the car laden down with shopping. Personally, we would have preferred it if Ford had invested the development time instead in bringing us the kind of opening tailgate glass feature that some MPVs and SUVs provide for the quick and easy slinging in of small bags and coats. Fortunately, the lack of this feature isn't the issue it might be if this hatch section was heavy to lift. As it is, the mechanism rises easily to reveal another difference between this car and supposed rivals from the stretch seven-seat compact MPV sector. Cars like the Renault or Citroen models I mentioned earlier, or indeed Ford's own Grand C-Max. When all three seating rows are in use, models of that class have such little luggage space that all you'd be able to carry a few plastic shopping bags. The Grand C-Max, for instance, offers just 88 litres of capacity. In contrast, when all the seats are upright in this S-Max, you get 285 litres to play with. OK, that's not a massive amount, but it gets pretty close to what's provided by the brand's boxier Galaxy model and is more than you get from the entire boot of most Super Minis. As a result, the space provided could at least be enough for a small pushchair. While below the floor, there is a useful uh, storage area that isn't compromised by the space saver rear wheel because that's hidden snugly underneath the car. You also get a bag hook and a luggage net to keep items in place. Yes, a van-based MPV like Ford's Grand Tourneo Connect would offer you a bit more room in this format, but with that kind of people carrier, you've got the hassle of physically having to lump out the third row chairs and store them in the garage if you're only travelling five up and need lots of boot space. There's none of that kind of hassle here. In an S-Max, these extra rearmost seats fold neatly into the floor and can do so with electrical assistance if you've avoided entry-level trim and opted for the extra-cost family pack I mentioned earlier. This power easy entry feature is activated via these buttons on the left-hand cargo area sidewall, though annoyingly, for reasons best known to Ford, it only works in flattening the seats, not in raising them again the way you can, at least with this third row, with an equivalent Galaxy model. Once the two chairs are attracted, a 965 litre space is freed up and can be covered by this useful reversible foldable loading mat which comes included with that optional family pack. To give you some perspective, the cargo area on offer in this format is about 20% less than a really large MPV like Ford's Galaxy, but about 20% more than the stretched seven seat models I've been talking about from the compact MPV class, the C4 Grand Picasso, the Grand Scenic, the Zafira Tura and so on. It might also be worth mentioning that you've got almost twice as much room here than you'd find in an equivalent version of Ford's Mondeo Estate. And unlike that car, there's the option of freeing up even more space by pushing forward the second row seating, provided you don't mind compromising middle seat legroom. For ultimate carriage capacity, you can, of course, fold the individual middle row chairs. Again, they push down flat into the floor, either manually or, in this case, electrically, if you've got that power easy entry option fitted. Now, you wouldn't expect doing this to free up as much space as you get in the boxy Galaxy, and it doesn't. The 2020 litre total revealed being 319 litres down on that car. It's a little more surprising, though, that this is the one interior configuration in which most of the smaller seven-seat MPVs I've been talking about can match this S-Max for luggage space, Vauxhall Safira Tura being almost the only exception, with 160 litres less. We would also have expected Ford to offer the option of a fold-flat front passenger seat that would have allowed the interior of this car to take really long items like kayaks and surfboards. Still, with nearly two metres of loading length on offer here, the capacity provided should be ample for most likely users. Oh. 
List pricing suggests that you'll be paying somewhere in the 25 to 33,000 pound bracket for your S Max, depending on the variant you choose. All models sold in this country come in a seven-seat configuration, and if you avoid the entry-level petrol and diesel variants, there's a £1,500 option for the power shift six-speed dual-clutch automatic transmission that we're trying here. Ford reckons that almost 97% of buyers will want one of the TDCI diesel variants, and you can see why. There are, after all, only a couple of petrol versions, with the 2-litre EcoBoost variant too expensive for most to run, and the entry-level 1.5-litre EcoBoost model saving you only £800 on the base diesel, but coming with 30% less pulling power and 20% higher running costs. Not tempting. So, diesel it is then, specifically a 2-litre one since all S-Max TDCI engines are of that size, even the top 210 PS flagship bi-turbo version. Looking at the various TDCI options available, we'd want to find the £800 premium to go from the rather feebly performing entry-level 120 PS unit to the mid-range 150 PS version. That, priced at around £26,000, probably represents the sweet spot in the lineup. Here, though, we are trying the slightly pokey 180 PS variant, but it's quite an expensive choice. Since you can't have this engine in basic ZTEC trim, you're looking at needing nearly £29,000 for it, which is quite a jump. If you want to take up the opportunity that this second-generation X-Max offers of finding an extra £1,500 for Ford's intelligent all-wheel drive system, you'll find it only in the diesel range, where it's only offered as an option on the 150 PS manual model and the 180 PS power shift automatic variant. So much for the S Max lineup. On to the value proposition it offers in comparison to other similar sized Family 4 models. The Blue Oval brand's comparably sized Galaxy MPV not only shares showroom space with this car, but also its floor plan and all its mechanicals, not its pricing structure though. Make like for like engine and trim comparisons, and you're looking at uh, mainstream S Max models saving you between 2,000 to 2,500 pounds on their Galaxy counterparts. And the difference will be even greater if you're looking at the most powerful variants. The other family Ford model that shares its underpinnings and engines with this one is the Mondeo Estate, a car which, in like-for-like -like terms, could cost you anywhere between £2,000 and £4,000 less, depending on the derivative that you're looking at. But then, of course, you would be getting a different world in terms of practicality. Perhaps one of Ford's other seven-seat MPVs would offer a closer match, or perhaps not. The company's van-based Grand Torneo Connect model might be a tad more spacious than an X-Max, but it lacks this car's family flexibility and, in style terms, is about as far away from this design as you could possibly get. It's also limited in its engine options, roughly comparable to this S-Max only in 1.5-litre 120 PS guys, in which form you'd save only around £3,500. Would Ford's smaller Grand C-Max model offer a better match? Not really. Again, volume diesel versions are based around that 1.5-litre 120 PS engine, in which form a Grand C-Max costs only around £3,000 less than a base S-Max diesel. If you could, you'd surely want to pay the extra, get this larger, more stylish car. The Grand C-Max is also offered with this model's 2-litre 150 PS diesel, but because C-Max buyers can only get that unit with super pricey trim, they'll have to pay near to S-Max money for it. Not tempting. On to alternatives beyond the Ford brand. At first glance, there are plenty of 7-seat MPV options in the 25 to £35,000 segment, but... As I've been suggesting all the way through this film, none of them are quite like an S-Max, a car that Ford has sized and priced almost exactly midway between really large MPVs and seven-seat versions of more compact models. As I've already said, if you want a large people carrier, something like a Seat Alhambra or a Volkswagen Charan, your Ford dealer will point you instead at that Galaxy model that I've been talking about. For the record, I'll tell you that equivalent versions of the Seat listed only a few hundred pounds more than their S-Max counterparts. Uh, but for the Charan, you're looking at a like-for-like -like premium of around £2,000 or more. 
It's far more likely, though, that you'll be considering this Ford against slightly more compact seven-seat MPVs like Vauxhall Zafira Tura, Citroën C4 Grand Picasso, Peugeot's 5008 and Renault's Grand Scenic. All of these alternatives will inevitably save you money over an equivalent S-Max. Reckon on anything between three and £5,000 in typical terms. But that is because they're slightly smaller and a better match, so Ford reckons, against the Grand C-Max. As you'll see elsewhere in this review, if you're making like-for-like -like practicality comparisons against cars like these with all three seating rows in place, an S-Max offers significantly more passenger room at the very back and if you've backseat folk on board much more luggage space the same practical issue applies if you're comparing an s max against the kind of seven seat family suv that you could buy for the same kind of money as an all-wheel drive version of this ford such a rival suv say kia sorento hyundai santa fe or land rover's discovery sport might well be physically as large as an s max but the bigger clunkier 4x4 systems common to that class of car mean a higher floor height so again more cramped conditions for third row folk. Plus, of course, an SUV comes with higher running costs too. If having considered all of this, you conclude that it is an S-Max that you really want, then you're going to want to know just how generous Ford has been with the standard spec. Well, let's see. Even the entry-level ZTEC variants come with alloy wheels of at least 17 inches in size, front and rear parking sensors, power-folding electric mirrors and a Thatcham Category 1 alarm. Inside, there's a keyless start system, sports seats and Ford's Sync 2 infotainment system accessed via an 8-inch colour touchscreen. Uh, through Sync 2, you can control audio, climate and phone functions via voice or touchscreen buttons. Another nice standard feature is the useful Ford MyKey system that recognises your favourite driving settings from an individually programmed ignition key. Most buyers will want to find the extra £1,700 to upgrade themselves to titanium spec that we're trying here. The next trim level up. This premium gets you LED daytime running lights, body coloured trim, privacy glass, an auto dimming rear view mirror, auto headlamps and wipers, a keyless entry system and cruise control with an active speed limiter that can automatically adjust your speed to the prevailing local limit. Most significantly, Titanium Spec also adds a DAB audio system and satellite navigation to that Sync 2 infotainment setup. If you want to go further, Top spec titanium sport trim adds a body styling kit, larger 18 inch alloy wheels, sport suspension, and heated seats. You can even talk to your dealer about a super luxury Vignale version with quilted leather, the option of an in car video system, and a specification its buyers will choose at their local showroom in a Swiss Vignale lounge. To be frank, though, we suggest that your money would better be spent on a mid range titanium trimmed S Max with some key extra cost features added, a car like the one we have here. So let's look at the key options. All buyers get the chance to specify an additional and very affordable family pack that gives you side window blinds, second row seat back tables, a 220 volt power outlet, a rear cargo net and a reversible foldable load mat. Choose this option on one of the titanium models and it will also include the Power Easy Entry System that electrically retracts the second and third row seating at the touch of a button. On this car, we've also got a range of other significant items. The upgraded Sony branded DAB audio setup, the huge glass panorama roof, those larger 18 inch alloy wheels and a winter pack that includes heat for the seats and the steering wheel rim and a plush titanium X pack that gives you leather trim for those seats and includes the clever adaptive LED headlights that turn with the bends and incorporate a glare free high beam system that doesn't dazzle other road users at night. This S Max also has the Active Park Assist system that can automatically steer this car into a parallel or a perpendicular space. It's all pretty complete. The only additional niceties that we would have liked to have tried but were lacking being the front split view camera that increases your field of view at junctions and comes with a rear view camera and the desirable multi-contour seats which can come with an active motion massage function. 
Optional features we'd be less inclined to want to consider include an active front steering system that can vary steering assistance with your speed, an electrically operable steering column and a hands-free powered tailgate that you can activate by waving your foot beneath the bumper. Self-leveling suspension and roof rails might be worth looking at, though, if you were regularly likely to be carrying weighty or bulky loads. And, of course, there's the usual range of tow bars, roof boxes, plus carriers for cycles, skis and snowboards, uh, the kind of thing that you'd expect for a car of this sort. On to safety. As you'd want in this day and age, all models include ESP stability control, traction control and an ABS braking system that's now been further optimised. And in panic stops, it'll be aided by EBA emergency brake assist, can reduce your braking distance by as much as a metre. Roll stability control and curve control look after you through the corners. You also get tyre pressure monitoring and Isofix child seat fastenings for the second row seats, plus plenty of airbags as part of Ford's IPS intelligent protection system. These include twin front, side and curtain airbags, plus a driver's knee bag. Should you wish to go further, then you can pay extra for various additional safety features. Here we've been trying adaptive cruise control, which automatically keeps you a safe distance behind the car in front on the highway. Then there's traffic sign recognition, which pictures road signs as you pass and displays them for you on the dash. You might also be familiar with blind spot information system technology, which will stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake when there's a car in your blind spot, and which, for S-Max buyers, is packaged up with a cross-traffic alert feature that stops you from reversing out of a space into the path of an oncoming car. Another option worth having is the pre-collision assist system that uses a forward-facing camera to scan the road ahead for pedestrians, cyclists or other potential collision hazards. If one's detected, then you'll be warned. If you don't respond, or you aren't able to, then the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Finally, we'd also want to look at a lane keeping assist pack that gives you three key features. A lane keeping aid that can apply steering torque to guide the car back into its lane once you've drifted out of it. An auto high beam system that automatically dips your headlights at night. And a driver alert setup that monitors your reactions for drowsiness and, if necessary, will alert you to stop for a restorative coffee. Ford needs S-Max buyers to be able to justify this car with their heads as well as with their hearts, uh, something that was only going to be possible if this second generation version considerably sharpened up its act in terms of efficiency. All the usual technology has been thrown at this Mark II model to ensure that it would. So there's smart regenerative charging which harvests energy which would otherwise be lost under braking. And an active grille shutter system which at a standstill and at start off keeps a clever front grille vent open to cool the engine but automatically closes it when you pick up speed, improving aerodynamics and helping to save fuel. The sleeker shape and carefully fashioned underbody aerodynamic shielding also play their part in reducing drag. To combat harmful fumes, there's an active thermal management system that improves warm-up times so that the engines reach peak efficiency faster. Plus, as you'd expect, there's the usual auto start-stop setup that cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. Diesel models also get more efficient cylinder head and fuel injection designs, plus a lean NOx exhaust trap after treatment system for cleaner emissions. All of this, combined with a series of other improvements to the rejuvenated Euro 6 range of EcoBoost petrol and TDCI diesel engine, has pretty much produced the desired result to the point where the volume petrol version in this Mark II model lineup is pretty much as clean and frugal as diesel derivatives of the original car. The model in question, the 1.5 litre EcoBoost SCTI variant, manages 43.5 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 149 grams per kilometre of CO2. 
Of course, the diesel versions that almost everyone will buy can now do a lot better than that. All are two litres in size, and assuming you're happy with a manual gearbox and front-wheel drive, you'll get the same returns whether you order your S-Max TDCI with 120, 150, or, as in this case, 180 PS. Specifically, I'm talking 56.5 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 129 grams per kilometre of CO2. That's not quite as good a showing as you get from the slightly smaller seven-seat MPVs like Renault's Grand Scenic or Citroën's C4 Grand Picasso, but it's on a par with the latest equivalent versions of large people-carrying rivals like Seat's Alhambra and Volkswagen's Chiran. A Ford Mondeo Estate with the same engine I'm using here would be about 15% cheaper to run, but as you'd expect, the S-Max is showing does exactly match that of its sister model, the Galaxy, which shares exactly the same engine range. Opting for either the power shift automatic gearbox or the all-wheel drive system isn't too ruinous in terms of running costs. In either case, you'll hit your returns by just over 5%. Even the top 210 PS bi-turbo diesel variant puts up a reasonable showing, managing 51.4 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 144 grams per kilometre of CO2. For completeness, I'll also give you the figures for the top petrol variant, the 240 PS 2 litre EcoBoost SCTI model. This manages 35.8 miles per gallon and 180 grams per kilometre. To help real world users get somewhere near all these quoted figures on an everyday basis, there's an illuminated arrow on the instrument panel to tell you when to change gear for maximum fuel efficiency. What else? Well, all S-Max models come with an unremarkable three-year, 60,000-mile Ford warranty with Ford assistance at the roadside for the first year. If you plan on keeping your car for longer or you're a high-mileage driver, you can pay a small extra cost to extend that warranty to either four years and 80,000 miles or five years and 100,000 miles. There's also the option of a Ford Protect Premium plan that over two or three years can cut the cost of scheduled servicing. That only leaves insurance groupings, which start at 17E for the base 120 PS diesel model, rising to 20E or 21E for the volume 150 PS diesel variants. This 180 PS TDCI version is rated at group 24E, while the top 2 litre 210 PS bi-turbo model rates at group 27E. Uh, for petrol variants, you're looking at Group 20E for the 1.5 litre derivative and Group 27E for the 2 litre SCTI variant. Most MPVs are enough to put you to sleep. With the S-Max, Ford has always tried to develop one with a bit of personality, proving that such vehicles needn't be dull and putting a smile on the faces of enthusiastic drivers with family commitments to meet. These are people who want an element of flair but aren't prepared to sacrifice basic people-carrying qualities like space, safety and practicality in order to get it. This second generation S-Max, like its predecessor, meets these needs in a way that, frankly, no other competitor can. All this, then, is much as before. What's changed is the evolution of this clever concept to suit a fresh, more demanding era, full of customers seeking levels of technology and efficiency that could never have been imagined when the first generation of this model was originally launched in 2006. As a result, we've been brought a car with over 20 new technologies, many of them never previously seen in this segment. A car able to automatically adjust its speed to seek the prevailing limit, to autonomously brake itself to avoid a crash, and to limit its own performance if you happen to have lent it out. A car that, depending on its variant, can offer SUV-style traction, GTI-style performance, leather-lined luxury or family hatch segment frugality. Of course, there's a slightly higher price to pay for this level of advancement, and some might feel that in the quest for ultimate efficiency and refinement, a little of the character of the Mark 1 model has been lost. We'll take that trade-off, though, as part of what is a much better product, one that's smarter, cleverer, and more advanced than anything else you could realistically compare it to. Not that there is anything else quite like an S-Max. To replicate its sportiness, you'd need something smaller. To match or beat its practicality in space, you'd need something more ponderous to drive. For us, 
It's the best seven-seater Ford makes. And for you, well, try one. You might find it quite a revelation. <laughs>